Hello, and welcome to this lecture on computer networks. This is from Chapter 7 of our reading. What is a network? A uh, network allows us to share resources by connecting devices together. We can share information. We can share data. We can share programs. Uh, we can share human communications. We can share uh, digital communications. It's very powerful. All the power of a single computer is enhanced by the ability to connect and share resources. Uh, a computer network is when computers are connected. There are networks that aren't computer networks, phone networks, uh, especially old analog phones. Those aren't computers, but they were networked together. There's social networks where it's just uh, uh, people connecting with people, not modern social media networks, but uh, just, you know, the, the good old boy network where you know somebody who knows somebody, and if you need your car fixed, they can uh, put you in touch with that. But we're looking at networks where the things that are connected are computers and all the resources on those computers. The Internet's probably the best example of this. And it's not just one network. It's really a global network of networks. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of private or business or education or government networks where they network their computers together to share resources, share one printer among multiple machines, share files, uh, email communications back and forth and so on. But those individual networks within an organization, private or public, government, education, uh, decide to share their network with other networks for the same purpose of sharing resources, and that gives us rise to the Internet. Uh, the example here of telephone service, the plain old television, uh, plain old telephone service, POTS, is talking about the old analog phones, how they were networked together. And the idea was still kind of the same, that we laid the foundation, or we, uh, there was a foundation laid, a communication channel, physical wires laid in the ground that allowed signals to be communicated. But uh, the old television system, uh, plain old television, shoot, I keep saying television, plain old telephone network, POTS, allowed, uh, worked on an analog transmission. Um, I think that's true. But... Um, we definitely are using digital now. Our mobile phones using cell towers, those are all digital. We'll talk more about cell towers here in just a little bit. And we also talk about satellites. What's the difference between cell phones and satellites? Cell phones use cell towers, and there's somewhat limited coverage. There are places, uh, even here in Kentucky, where you don't have cell coverage. Satellite phones are much less common, much more expensive, um, but they have the advantage that they're communicating up into the sky to satellites. So you can have satellite coverage using a satellite phone in places that cell towers wouldn't reach. So in this example, a person's at the top of a mountain and is able to talk on his satellite phone. Uh, but if he had uh, the girl's uh, cell phone on top of the mountain, he probably would not have coverage. Global positioning systems, speaking of satellites, uh, we haven't really talked about uh, the GPS system, which consists of, I think it's 24, it doesn't say it here on the slides, but there's 24 satellites in geosynchronous orbit, which means they stay in the same relative location that as the Earth rotates, the satellite's moving at just the right speed to where if you were pointing at the sky, uh, you wouldn't have to move your finger to keep pointing at the satellite. That's what we happen when you, if you have satellite TV at your home. You set the dish up pointing at a certain spot and you don't have to move it even though the Earth's spinning, the satellite's spinning at just the right speed that it stays in geosynchronous orbit where it moves, it looks as if it's exactly in the same point in the sky. A collection of 24 of those put up by the United States government are the basis of the uh, GPS, Global Positioning System. Uh, it requires four satellites to be visible at any point in time for you to get a point on the Earth. And that kind of makes sense. If you just had one satellite, you wouldn't know exactly where on the the Earth, you would know how far you were from the satellite, but that would give you, there's really a big circle on the Earth where you are that far away. And two satellites gives you two big circles, and they overset in two points, and three satellites gives you three big circles. They overset, overlap in only one point. But if you bring in height uh, above and below seawater, height into it, then a fourth satellite uh, gives you a real accurate GPS location. So as we have networks, we have devices that get connected to our networks. Of course, the computers and the resources there, but also other things like uh, your thermostat or your refrigerator or your cell phone or your smart other smart devices. These all have the ability to share information back and forth because of this network. Uh, 
in another chapter, we could probably talk about the downside of all these devices being connected, especially if they get hacked. They don't have proper security placed on them, and uh, then they can become hacked and used for malicious purposes, sending out spam and so forth, even worse than that. Um, but the potential is more good than bad if they're used correctly and they're protected. We can uh, monitor the temperature of our home from a distance. There's an example in the chapter somewhere where they talk about uh, unlocking and locking your, your, your front door uh, remotely using uh, because it's connected to the network and other things that we can do. Other examples of once we have networks that we can uh, benefits can come from it. Multimedia, the ability to share uh, video and audio, not just static textual files. Uh, the ability to watch your TV from a remote distance somewhere. If you've got something recorded at home and you're traveling for a business purpose, but you want to see the latest episode of uh, your favorite HBO series or your favorite uh, item that was recorded from local television, you can, and it's recorded on your box at home, you can share that with yourself over uh, the network. And of course, the basis of Netflix and a lot of TV streaming is the ability to do this uh, multimedia distribution. Video conferencing, collaborative computing, telecommuting, uh, these ideas are getting into and changing the way we think about work. Video conferencing allows you to have uh, see somebody on a screen as if you were face-to-face, -face. so you don't physically have to travel to Texas to have a face-to-face -face virtual face-to-face -face meeting with somebody through video conferencing. Telecommuting, the idea is I'm not commuting to work and home, I'm uh, using technology to take my presence to work, meet with people at work, uh, but I still actually get to do that from home. Collaborative computing, sharing resources, working in teams, all those uh, ideas are being rethought because of what technology allows us to do. The idea that we have to come to work Monday through Friday for eight hours a week from uh, nine until five, uh, be in the office so that people have access to you and they need to get information from you. Those are being those assumptions are being challenged and rethought as to what's the best way to work because of the technology that's available to us. Telemedicine, this is going to be a big deal. Right? When you're sick and you need to see a doctor, instead of having to physically go to a physical doctor's office or to urgent care or to a hospital every single time you want to see a doctor, some of your medical care can occur through telemedicine where again, the doctor doesn't physically come to you and you don't physically go to the doctor's office, but through technology, the doctor is able to see you, talk to you, interact with you, explain your situation. And you can imagine there will be special devices created to uh, further assist with that. Take your blood pressure and share that information remotely, maybe even uh, analyze your blood and a number of other things. This is going to be a big, big thing as the population gets older people are going to be investing in and coming up with amazing ways to use telemedicine. Uh, this figure is showing some more telemedicine applications. The, the whole medical field is being impacted by technology in a number of ways, not just telecommunications, but the use of robots, the use of data mining, the use of data analytics, the use of uh, uh, computers and, and graphics and visualization, all of that. We're getting better health care because of technology. But telemedicine is one element of that. I think in this figure, sorry, let me go back to this figure. See the doctor in this figure right there? Uh, he's not physically in the room, but he's able to see the patient. And the patient's able to tell the doctor exactly what he or she is feeling. And the doctor, he or she, is able to respond to the patient. And that's a good thing. More about networks. Uh, you have to have a communication channel between the two devices. That communication channel can be a physical wired connection or it can be a wireless connection. And for, um, oops, I thought I had another slide on that. I don't. Uh, so for the wired connections, that can be uh, coax cable, that can be uh, twisted pair, that can be fiber optic. I think I've got another slide in the presentation about that in a minute. And the wireless connections are along the electromagnetic spectrum. That includes radio and microwave and infrared. As we connect devices together, we have topology options on how we want to connect those together. We can use a star network where everything connects to a central node. Um, and new devices make one connection to that central node. And that central node corresponds all communications between them. A bus network works a little different. What you're connecting to is a communication channel, not a computing device, but the communication channel. 
The example of a bus network is the air in a room full of people talking. And you just talk into the air and everybody hears it, but uh, you know it's not great for privacy. And if you were doing privacy, you'd want to talk in secret code, pig Latin, or something else where other people who are listening wouldn't understand it. Mesh network is what we have probably most common where we're not strictly making sure that every node on the network follows the bus or follows the star or follows the ring network, I think talks about in the chapter uh, or other options, but you just do what's convenient for the task at hand. This figure shows a bus network in the upper right hand corner. We see there's the thick line bus, uh, the communication channel and devices are connecting to it. Um, the figure at the bottom says a mesh network, but it looks like every device is connected to every device. Uh, that's not very uh, hybrid-y or meshy. That's a, uh, if you added three more devices and each of those three devices was connected to one, two, and three devices and these connections didn't change, that would be more of a mesh network. And this uh, figure on the left is a star network where every device is being connected to a single item on that network. Your home network is more like a star network where you have your wireless router that where your internet access comes in and then everything connects to that wireless router. Uh, client and server are terms that we use in a network terminology. The client is what you, the end user, are using. And the server is uh, hardware and software that is responding to your requests. So in a standalone, not non-network, right, the CPU is, is responding to whatever you're asking the computer to do, running programs and doing those things. Uh, if we imagine that some of the work that you're requesting, some of the files that you're requesting is not on your local machine, but some other machine, that other machine is the server. And you're sitting there with your CPU requesting a file, but your CPU doesn't deliver it. It goes through the network to another CPU to get the files, to get the data, to get the information, to get the processing, to get the image that you want. And it brings it to your machine to satisfy your request. So you're using, as the, as the end user, you're on a server machine. And a client machine is usually a dedicated to... Um, responding to client requests, listening to client requests and responding to those. You typically don't have on a server machine a person sitting there playing multimedia or playing Minesweep or surfing the web or reading the email. It typically doesn't have a human user on it. It's configured by a human user, of course, the network administrator or somebody. Uh, but then it just sits there and listens to requests from other computers and responds to those requests. So here we see... Um, a network server and the clients are requesting information from that network server and it's being sent to those clients or a print server right uh, a shared device like a printer could be on the network and it's just sitting there waiting for people to say hey would you print this file for me and it prints the file hey would you print this file for me from a different client and it prints the file from that other client the other option if you're not doing a client server is to do peer-to-peer -peer, where uh, you don't have this hierarchy of uh, a dedicated server that's listening to responses and clients that are wanting to get work done, but every node is kind of the same. Files are distributed across multiple nodes, and each peer is um, functionally the same. This is how a lot of the file sharing, music sharing sites are working. Uh, if you had a client server, you could just take down the server and you would take down the, the file sharing that's going on. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, Every node has some of the files or even all the files, and they're sharing them back and forth. And it's a, uh, more distributed and uh, a little more difficult to, uh, uh, to take it down in that sense. Network characteristics, we talk about the size of a network. How big is a network, right? It can cover the entire world. It can cover just your, uh, you know, your home network. So we use these things like local area network, LAN, metropolitan area network, MAN, wide area network, W-A-N, and we call those LAN, MAN, and WAN, to talk about, the, to give the general scale of what we're talking about. It's not a precise definition, but it gives us the general scale. There's also personal area networks that are actually, you know, on a general scale, referring to you and the electronic devices that you have on yourself and how they might communicate. And um, uh, there can be others. There, there, there are other of those acronyms that'll come out. But it, the idea here is just to give a basic scale so are we talking about the size of a football or the size of a low uh you know a, a mountain right is this a bigger or smaller than mickey mouse right it's uh it's just those general mindset questions that it's helpful that we have some idea of scale and that's where uh, that comes into play 
So we have an internet, which we haven't talked about yet in this video. We have an internet, which has its own set of protocols. You can use internet protocol, but not share yourself with the internet. You can create a private network, but use internet protocol because it's well-defined and well-understood. That's what we mean by an intranet. It uses internet protocols. Everybody knows how to do that, or not that everybody knows. It's well known, especially for people who do networking things. Uh, there's lots of standard tools and parts and support out there, but you're still creating a private network. You're not sharing your local network that uses internet protocol with the rest of the internet. So it's called an intranet um, and an extranet. Uh, and the idea behind an intranet is it's within the organization, right? Other people outside can't see it. An extranet would be um, making something intentionally visible to the outside world and maybe not even uh, allowing internal real work to be done on it. So that, again, could be um, some very public-facing uh, presence on the web that you might want to have for an organization, but you don't want any important files to be on there that people might uh, get their hands on. And a virtual private network, this idea of a VPN, this is kind of a neat idea. So I'm using standard internet TCP IP protocols that allow me to communicate with another computer somewhere in Texas or California or North Carolina or wherever. But I'm adding a layer of encryption and complexity that allows me to have a secure connection over the internet, which itself is not designed for security. But by using this VPN, virtual private network protocol, this virtual private network algorithms on the data as it's being sent back and forth, we can basically create uh, this idea of a, a private tunnel, right? Within the publicness of the internet, we can have private communications going on. Okay, uh, which of the following describes a group of private secure paths set up using the internet? Um, a VPN A, so we just talked about. Question two, true or false? With a bus network, all the devices are connected directly to each other without the use of a central hub. Uh, that's false. With a bus network, everything is connected to the bus. Uh, three, a private network is set up similar to the World Wide Web for use by employees within the organization. The idea, the key there, word there is that it's a private network within an organization, so that's called an intranet. It's a, and specifically, it's a private network set up using TCP IP and World Wide Web technology. Uh, protocols. Okay, uh, part two of our three parts for this video, data transmission characteristics. Okay, so we've got communication channel, we've got devices that are sharing information. How does the signal transfer? Well, uh, a couple terms here. We'll talk about bandwidth, which is a little bit different than speed, and we'll talk about analog and digital. First, let me go ahead and say analog and digital. That's what the figure shows on the right. We've already talked about this before in class, and I think you probably read about this before. Uh, when we talked about computers and CPUs, that computers are digital devices. We represent data just using ones and zeros. And those ones and zeros can be electrical pulses. Those ones and zeros can be magnetic attraction and retraction, uh, uh, repulsion. Those ones and zeros can be frequencies of radio waves where you have high frequency and low frequency or, or uh, amplitude modification, AM radio. Uh, frequency mod modulation, FM radio. There's any number of ways that we can represent two distinct values. And when we have two distinct values, uh, we're talking about a digital representation. Computers use digital representations, and computers are very, very fast because they're using uh, electric uh, representations of that, and the currents, the, the uh, uh, voltages move extremely fast so we have fast fast processing but sometimes we want to use analog signals analog signals are continuous signals like the second hand on a clock that goes all the way around the clock from 12 1 to it doesn't instantly jump from 1 to 2 to 3 it moves slowly from 1 to 2 2 to 3 2 3 to 4 smoothly i should say not slowly it moves smoothly through every possible state uh, analogs are like the figure shows that it's, it's much smoother, less abrupt than digital. Uh, but we can still work with analog through frequency modulation and amplitude modulation and other techniques to transfer our information there. Uh, what about bandwidth? Okay, so regardless of whether it's analog or digital, 
What about the bandwidth? What are we talking about? Is that the same thing as speed? And no, bandwidth is not the same thing as speed. That's kind of the idea, right? Higher bandwidth tends to transfer data faster, but it's not the same as speed. And the best analogy for this is think about I-65 and two vehicles going down I-65 side by side at the exact same speed. One of those is a little two-person Volkswagen Beetle. The other one is an 18-wheel Mack truck. They're both going down I-65 at 65 miles an hour, but they have different bandwidths because the Mack truck could carry a lot more information. I could get a lot more watermelons on an 18-wheel Mack truck than I could um, how many watermelons I could get in a VW Bug. Right? In fact, I could get a lot of VW Bugs inside of one 18-wheel Mack truck. So bandwidth is, speed is part of bandwidth, but it's also capacity. Uh, serial and parallel are terms that we talk about in network language. Serial means one at a time. And there are some things that work better serial, but it's faster to send data at blocks at a time. Whether it's 8 bits at a time, which is a byte, or 16 bits, or 32 bits, or 64 bits at a time. Uh, the more bits at a time we're sending in one parallel block, the you know the higher the bandwidth. So even if, here's a good example of bandwidth. The they might all be traveling at the same speed, but the bandwidth is higher in parallel because more information is getting there. Even though the ones and zeros are traveling the same speed, the other has higher bandwidth. Synchronous and asynchronous. The the idea here is that uh, with synchronous transmission. Uh, everything's going in uh, regular specified intervals, asynchronous. It's, you don't know how long it's going to be from one data transmission to the next data transmission. Um, and isosynchronous is where things get uh, uh, synced up together. And the, this figure on the next slide is the best way to understand this. Traditional TCP IP internet data transmission Data is broken into fixed size packets, and then the packets are all sent off together. That's a good example of synchronous. It's this packet, then this packet, then this. We're watching a video on YouTube. You're getting packet after packet after packet after packet, and they're being sent in a consistent uh, um, rate. Now, they may get routed to you differently, and there may be some delays, so you're going to see the little speed bar across the bottom. The, the buffer is not going to be always perfectly smooth but the transmission is still being synchronous. Asynchronous is typing at a keyboard. As soon as you're sitting at the keyboard, you're not typing anything, the computer's fine, it's not gonna say anything. As soon as you start typing hello and you type H, it sends that H and it appears on your screen. And there might be a two, three second pause before you type E. And as soon as you type the E, it sends the E. So that's an example of asynchronous. It just doesn't know when it's gonna happen and the next thing's gonna come along. So there it's saying, you know, dear sir, and the D and the E and the A and the R, they're coming along. Uh, based on when the user types it, and you don't know when that's going to be. Isosynchronous is syncing up two different things like the video and the audio at the same time, and then they get sent together. Simplex, half-duplex, full-duplex, again, technical terms. Simplex is data travels in one di direction only, like a radio tower. You can listen to a signal from a radio tower with a radio receiver in your car, but you can't send data from your car to the radio tower. It's a simplex transmission. Half duplex is like walkie-talkies uh, or CB radios. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is Smokey Bear on channel 19. You know, and then you have to, you know, a lot of times you say over, and this over means you're done transmitting and the other person can talk. You do that on walkie-talkies, you do that on CB radios, and you may have never used either one of those. Um, but one of the things that's unique about walkie-talkies and CB radios is you can't talk at the same time. You have to take turns. Full duplex, both people can be talking at the same time. Like talking on your cell phone, like talking in the air to each other, uh, like talking on your old analog phones. I'm talking, you're talking, we can hear each other at the same time. Delivery method. So how is the data going to be sent from destination, source to destination? Circuit switching, this is what the uh, old television, the plain old television system system did. It would set up a circuit from the caller to the receiver, and that circuit existed, the, a path from A to B, a path from source to destination, 
would remain open the entire phone call. And then when the phone call ended, it would go away. And the next phone call would create its own new dedicated circuit. Those lines, those nodes, that material was being dedicated for that call. Packet switching is what the internet uses. It does not create a fixed circuit from your computer to a computer in Texas for your friend that you're emailing. What happens is the email you're sending gets broken up into packets, and the packets get sent from your computer to his computer or her computer in Texas, but they get sent. Each no, each packet of your message can go on a different path. Um, broadcasting is, uh, um, again, sounds more like a one-way uh, approach to the material. But packet switching is what we use on the internet. Circuit switching is what the old television system used to use. Here's a figure that shows this. In the left figure circuit switch network, there is a one single red dedicated circuit from the sender to the receiver. And for the entire communication time period, however long it is, a phone call, for example, uh, that circuit's going to be there. Now, a day later or an hour later or five minutes later, you can redial the person and you have a new phone call and the, it might be a different circuit, but it will be dedicated for that next entire transmission. On packet switching, which is how we do the internet, the middle figure, there's the sender on the left and the recipient on the upper right and data gets broken up into packets. But you can see that packet A follows a green path, packet B follows a blue path, packet C follows a red path. They're going along different paths. They're all going with the, from the sender to the receiver, but they're going different ways. They get put back together when they receive at the destination. Um, that is better for handling high volume. It's also better for handling nodes that are constantly uh, appearing or disappearing on the network for any number of reasons. Broadcast is more like a radio tower. One sender sends it out to everybody. So I talked about wired networks. In fact, there's three options there. Here's the slide that talks about that. Twisted pair, coax cable, and fiber optic. We talk about that in uh, probably in class as well as in the reading. This figure gets to the idea the twisted pair uh, literally has the physical wires. Each one has its own wrapped insulation. They Two of them get wrapped together. They all get bundled together inside insulation. But when you strip off the insulation, you have the individual parts, and you can put those together in a little clip joint that kind of looks like the, uh, that is the, the clip you plug into the back of your computer. Coax cable has a copper uh, uh, material at the inner side wrapped by insulation. And this is the coax that screws directly into the back of your television or that screws into your cable modem to bring your internet connection uh, from the outside world to your home network and then from your home network you plug twisted pair cables or wirelessly you connect to your home uh, router fiber optic cables you probably don't have physically contact with fiber optic cables but this is what the backbone of the internet is the very high speed high bandwidth uh, connections that go from california to new york or california to st louis and st louis to atlanta and atlanta to nashville and nashville up to new york and um, those are going to be um, fiber optic cables. And these are the same cables that we also lay uh, under the ocean to connect continents together. Wireless media. So if we're not doing one of the three wired connections, we have options for wireless. All the wireless connections are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, here's a figure that shows the electromagnetic spectrum for us. We can see that visible light's a little tiny uh, range within that much larger area. So the Roy G. Biv, red, orange, green, yellow, blue, indigo, violet, a visible light, the rainbow that we see in the sky when water diffracts and the sun is behind us, that's a small part of the large uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And as the frequencies get too large or too small for our eyes to recognize, they still exist, and they exist in ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays uh, at one end, and on the lower frequency, infrared and radio frequency. Radio frequency has the advantage that it can pass through walls. You can have a radio receiver inside of a room and still hear the radio. Infrared uh, does not. So one of the things about uh, one of the slides here in a second, we say that uh, RF has replaced IR, radio frequency has replaced infrared frequency, because it does not require a line of sight. Satellite communication is closer to the infrared, and unfortunately, satellite does require line of sight. Uh, these are the specific ranges for some of those. 
which I'm not going to ask you to memorize these ranges. Just know that that's referring to those numbers are referring to this chart in terms of the frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's where these gigahertz are coming from and megahertz are coming from. Cellular, cellular radio transmission. So this is using radio frequency. And this is the radio towers that we have for our cell phones. Um, and it's not just one cell tower. We have lots and lots of cell towers. And they share the information between them. Now, our book describes the connection here as honeycombed shaped zones. Now, of course, it's not a honeycomb shape. It's, it's a circular shape. It just sends out its range. It's, if you were to draw the range of a tower, you would probably draw it as a circle more than you draw it as a honeycomb. But these towers work together. And as soon as you start getting closer to another tower than, a, than uh, the original tower, the transmission will switch between them. This figure kind of shows it better. The green there for cell A and the blue for cell B and the, the orange for cell C, yellow orange for cell C, and there'd be D, E, F, G. There'd be a lot of other cell towers that are all working together. If I drew the entire range of cell A, it would actually be a circle and it would be bigger than the green area. But it only has to provide coverage within that honeycomb because north, south, east, west, southwest, northwest, each of those other areas of the honeycomb, a different tower takes over. So it's honeycomb shaped, not because of physics, which would be weird, but it's honeycomb shaped because of uh, transferring the transmission off to other towers. And the towers are strategically placed to give us that honeycomb look and feel. Microwaves. Um, require line of sight. Uh, microwave stations are therefore typically very high or the top top of buildings in cities and the satellites are microwave stations. They use microwave transmissions to hit the satellites up in the sky. You can be low earth orbit or medium earth orbit for where those satellites are. The GPS's are typically in medium earth's orbit. Uh, this is not the topic on this class but it's actually getting crowded out in space. And one of the big challenges is that uh, nobody owns space. No country owns space. So as countries are putting satellites out in space, uh, it's a finite, even though it's massive, but it's, it's still a limited resource. And there's going to be some, uh, some challenges there moving forward as more and more it becomes more and more important to have a presence in space and a limited amount of space there for that, a limited amount of area. In space, especially when they start having, uh, uh, it's it's all yeah. So just keep that in mind in the future. It's not the point of this class, but it's going to be a big deal. So here we see uh, just a figure showing you know data bounces up to the satellite and bounces back. It takes about a quarter of a second for a signal to go from location A on Earth to location B on Earth to bounce off a satellite. And then to communicate back another quarter of a second. So there's about a half second delay when you're using satellite transmissions. If you're using fiber optics under the ocean, you don't have to deal with that half second delay. Infrared, remember, requires uh, line of sight. Um, because of this limitation, that second or that third bullet, uh, RF, radio frequency, is being used to replace infrared because it does not. The radio does not require line of sight because radio frequencies can go through walls. They're at a lower frequency and like a, a person speaking in a lower tone with a lower frequency, it has it carries a little bit farther. A woofer carries farther farther than a speaker does the sound from a woofer because of the lower frequency. Second quiz: Which of the following transmission media transmits data as light pulses? So the media that does this is uh, the fiber optic letter B. True or false? Cellular radio is a form of wireless transmission. That's true. But uh, in question three, the device located in space that orbits the Earth to provide communications is a satellite. Okay, part three. Almost done here. So, we're talking about networks. Um, computers are not smart. They're smart like a refrigerator, right? which is not very smart. So there has to be a set of well-defined rules about how they're going to interact and share their information. Protocols are those well-defined rules for how they interact. Standards are a little different. Standards, uh, a protocol is a standard, but standards are more than protocols. Standards are created by organizations that uh, allow us to uh, communicate what 
uh, how we're going to handle. And so you would, uh, an organization would establish standards, including some protocols, but other things would be involved in our standards as well. TCP IP, this is the protocol of the internet. The TCP part is talking about packets and how they get uh, communicated. Uh, the C stands for communication in TCP and the P stands for protocol. There's another protocol called IP that stands for internet protocol where each node uh, on the internet is um, given a unique IP address. So we know destination, uh, source and destination of our data. So we know where we're going, we know where we're sending it from, and how we send it is the TCP part of TCP IP. We use packet switching, where each node gets there independently, and um, this figure kind of shows it. So here's an email in step one. It's a, and that email is broken up into three fixed size blocks, blue, green, and, and light red or pink. Each of those individual blocks is wrapped and addressed and numbered one, two, three, specified the destination. They're all going to the same place, and then they all get sent to that place. When they re get to the destination, they get unpacked, put back together, and Jim, in this case, reads the email that Sue is sending him. But what we see there in step three, which is in the bottom right, the way they get there, they can each follow their own route. They do not have to go the same node to node to node to node between Sue and Jim, right? So that's the idea on TCP IP. There are other protocols. There's a protocol for the World Wide Web. There's a protocol for file transfer. There's a protocol for simple mail, the way that our mails get sent. They have their own protocol. Now that SMTP makes use of TCP IP. TCP IP is the underlying plumbing that allows an email to be sent, but we have lots of protocols when we deal with technology because technology is not smart. It's precise. It's clear. It's like math. Right? There's no mystery what the square root of 105 is, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. A computer would know what the square root of 105 is and get it to me in eight digits, you know, decimal digits accuracy without any trouble. I'm not good at that. Computers are great at algorithms and numbers. Uh, but they have to have well-defined protocols that they follow because they're not human. Ethernet is a standard that is used for wired networks. Very, very common. It's always evolving. Um, it works for twisted pair, coax, and fiber optic. All of our wired cables can make use of the Ethernet standard. This slide shows us some of the iterations of Ethernet. All right, 10 megabits per second, 1,000 megabits per second, which is a gigabit, uh, 10 gigabits or 10,000 megabits, 40 gigabits, 100 gigabits, 1,000 gigabits, which is a terabit. All right, so we've got lots and lots of bits per second, different speeds, but these all fall under the Ethernet protocol, which happens to be 802.3. And I don't know what 801 is. I don't know what 802.4 is. Uh, but 802.3, for networking people, they know that that was the, the group that formed the Ethernet standard. That was the ID number they gave it. Right. 802.11 is a well-known one. Just like 802.3 was for Ethernet, 802.11 is well-known. It's the standard for Wi-Fi, wireless. And it has its own set of rules, and it's constantly evolving. Right. 802.11g, 802.11n, 802.11ac. These are all protocols, uh, versions of 802.11, versions of Wi-Fi that are out there. And it's going to continue to evolve into a change and still be ver you know, modifications and edits to 802.11. Uh, here's those standards, B and A and G and N and AC, which is what you'll find, I think, uh, either N or AC or what you're going to find on your wireless routers at Best Buy. If you walk by Best Buy this afternoon and walk down their wireless routers, you'll probably see uh, they might have some G's in there, but they'll probably have uh, N's, which uh, they tend to be backwards compatible, and AC. If you go to Google search right now or Amazon and search for wireless router, you will see that it'll say 802.11 G and AC and the compatibilities it has between those. 802.16 is a little newer, not as common, but the idea here is why Max. It's also a wireless uh, standard 
but it covers a broader area than 802.11 Wi-Fi. This figure shows us 802.11 Wi-Fi and 802.16 Wi-Max visually. We can see that the Wi-Fi hotspot just doesn't cover as big of a, as big of a range as Wi-Max does. So as this standard becomes refined and more reliable uh, and more effective and the parts are being developed by companies, that's part of the reason we have a standard is that lots and lots of companies can build parts for it and we as consumers can choose the best one, uh, we might start seeing Wi-Max becoming more and more and more common for us. Cellulars have their own standards. You've heard of 2G, 3G, 4G networks. Same idea. You're using standards for your cellular towers. Uh, your phones are built using 4G, which means that they know that they're going to transmit in a certain way and that the cellular towers that are using 4G towers are going to send and receive in a certain way. And it's going to allow you to use uh, higher speed, higher bandwidth. On a small scale, we have things like Bluetooth and other short range wireless standards. Bluetooth is about 30 yards, uh, 30 feet, about 10 yards Right, it's about how far you can use Bluetooth, and it'll start messing up. Sometimes, uh, potentially even uh, less than that, depending on the strength of the signal. Uh, there's also wireless USB and Wi-Fi Direct, and we see there's a whole host of wireless short-range options that are out there that are being developed. Um, Bluetooth is probably the best known wireless USB. This is probably what you have for your wireless keyboard, wireless mouse. You can probably have a USB that plugs into your computer and it's using uh, not Bluetooth but wireless USB. Or it might be using Bluetooth and you don't plug anything into your device. It just connects through Bluetooth. And there's others, as you can see on this list, that are being developed and they're constantly being developed. And this list will be different in a year and in two years and in five years. Networking hardware. So your computer... Uh, has to connect to the network. One way to do that is to plug a card into the expansion slot of your hardware. Remember your hardware, we talked about the expansion slots on the motherboard. You can plug in a network interface card called a NIC, N-I-C, and you would take your computer and make it network compatible. Uh, more and more, we're seeing that network compatibility is built in to our computers because we expect our computers to work and communicate on a network, whether it's a wired connection for a NIC card or uh, Wi-Fi built in, assuming you're going to be in a Wi-Fi environment, uh, Bluetooth compatibility built in, so you can have personal Bluetooth devices and all of those. Uh, a modem is also part of the networking hardware terminology that you're probably familiar with, or you uh, will see it, the term used more and more often. This is a, stands for a modulator demodulator modem. It allows you to take a signal of one type, like a coax cable coming from the internet company, and transfer it into a wireless network signal or a uh, Ethernet connection uh, wired signal in your home that you could use for twisted pair uh, connection. So here's some of that hardware. Here's some of the hardware, including the upper left-hand corner a network access card and other devices for connecting uh, and um, but one more slide, and I'll show you the other figure I was going to talk about. In addition to a router, we have things like switches. Uh, and in addition to the modem, some other terminology we use is a switch, which allows you to send data to a specific recipient, just like a single switch on a wall updates a single light in the room. Switches are dedicated. Routers, on the other hand, um, pass data uh, 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 Oh, between networks, it's at a broader level. So if you think about there's a route to drive from here to Nashville or a route to drive from here to New York. And it would involve a number of interstates and smaller roads and smaller roads than that and even a driveway perhaps or two. Uh, and you would build a route by connecting driveways to backstreet roads to uh, small roads to interstate roads. Uh, and you could build a route that way. And a wireless access point, this is what um, it provides. The connection sends out wirelessly to everything in that area. So uh, your wireless router, if you have internet at your home or your apartment or wherever you're at work, you probably have a device like this. And this wireless router has a modem, so it converts from uh, the internet service provider to your network in your home. It has a switch, so there's a... Uh, there's one line coming in, but you can see there's four connections at the top of this 
image here. So the switch is allowing four devices to have uh, wired connections. It's also got a wireless connection in that size. So all your wireless devices that are within range can be recognized. This figure shows us uh, some of the hardware that's going on behind the scenes for us to have internet in our homes. So we have an ISP, which is an internet service provider. They're the people that are uh, we're paying a fee, monthly fee, to uh, connect the internet to us, and they're connected to the internet, so we connect to them. Therefore, we connect to the internet. The internet comes to us, but we have to take that ISP, that internet service provider, the cable they give us, and we connect it to a wireless router so that all the devices in our home can be connected to it. And that figure, it shows it being connected to a cable modem uh, in the house on the left and just a modem on the house on the right. I don't know why they called it modem instead of, wire, uh, instead of cable modem. Um, but then the cable modem is connected to a wireless router. A lot of times that's one device, right? They build those devices together. And our last quiz. Which of the following is the protocol used to transfer data over the Internet? That would be TCP IP. A uh, wireless router from home for home Internet connection typically includes a modem. That's true. Most of today's uh, wireless routers is going to... Um, uh, 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 the modem is going to be a wireless router. I may have been worded poorly. You, you get a cable modem from the Internet service provider, but it typically has a wireless router built into it. I think that could be worded uh, the other way around. But they're, they're, they're consolidating all those hardware. And there's typically a switch in it also, so you can plug multiple devices, multiple wired devices in, plus a wireless router. Set of Number three, a set of rules for a particular situation. That's a protocol. And we definitely have protocols when dealing with dumb computers, but we also have protocols... Uh, in very non-technical, like military and uh, um, international affairs and other things. Lots of protocols there. Okay, enjoy the chapter and uh, have a great day.